Gillian Caldwell and Peter Gabriel are here. They work with an organization called Witness. Peter Gabriel is also a musician. Since 1992, Witness has trained human rights advocates to use video to document and publicize abuses around the world. Also here is Van Jones. He is the executive director of the Books Not Bars program, which recently co-produced a documentary with Witness on abuses in the California juvenile justice system. Here is a look at the film. Parents hope their children would be changed for the better, only to see them emerge from the CYA harder, angrier, more mentally unstable, or more criminally sophisticated, if they emerge at all. The day that I got out um, was really hard. I, funny enough, I really actually didn't want to leave. I remember crying and just saying that I didn't want to leave. And he was asking me, like, why? And um, I told him that I was scared. I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to leave. Um, just being in CYA, entering it as, like, a juvenile, and then coming out as an adult was, like, completely scary for me. Like, I didn't know what to do. Like, you know, they don't, when you leave, they don't tell you, like, you know, we're going to follow up with you or you're going to, we have this program set up for you. I didn't know whether I was going to come out and just mess up again and end up going to jail for life, you know? I am pleased to have the three of them here at this table to talk about what is a remarkable effort to use video uh, to make cases and to try to do well. Uh, this came from, from, Rodney King? Well, there was a proposal. Actually, I'd met on the Human Rights Now tour, which Amnesty did around the world. It right. uh, was really my education in human rights. And for the first time, you know, I actually met people who'd been tortured or watched their family murdered. And it seemed incredible that they could suffer extraordinary abuses and then have their experience totally denied, forgotten, and buried. Uh, and when there were examples of pictures or film or video, it was much harder uh, to lose the stories. So we made the proposal a couple of times, and after the Rodney King incident, uh, it was clear to a lot of people that having a camera in the right place at the right time can make a real difference. Uh, Reebok Human Rights Foundation funded it, and the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights provided the first home. And what has it done <coughs> since then? Well, it's put cameras uh, out in uh, many countries all over the world, and armed uh, human rights activists with a new tool. And I think both in um, changing laws, uh, in getting their case heard around the world, um, in helping people not to feel isolated, desperate, and forgotten, uh, it's done a lot. I mean, in, m in many instances, it's still, I think, the tip of the iceberg. There's, there's a huge amount that needs doing, um, but the work has begun. Mm. Um, tell me what you do. I'm the director at Witness, so it's my job to sort of ensure that Witness stays current in terms of its mission to donate video cameras to human rights groups and help train them to use video in strategic ways in what we call uh, tactical media. So the point of our work is really to help groups clarify what's the problem, what's the solution, who can implement the solution to the problem, and how can video help create a persuasive argument to convince those people that have the power to make a difference in the context of those decisions. What have you learned so far about how to make those decisions? Well, the first thing we know is that you've got to be very clear about what the problem is, and you have to define the problem clearly enough that you're not tackling, biting off more than you can chew. You can't make a persuasive visual argument unless you've identified with clarity a problem. And I think it's also incredibly important not just to be um, crying wolf, essentially, but also very clear about what the solutions are. And I think if you if you present a compelling, narrative, story-driven explanation of a problem and a solution, people are inclined to go with you. Is anybody not in favor of this? Uh, well, around the world, you know, you've got a lot of governments that yeah. are quite repressive, in fact, and our human rights partners who are local organizations worldwide face enormous repression, you know, fighting against the odds, government-controlled media, and sometimes yeah. risk their lives to document the abuses they're, they're documenting. Give me a good example of that. 
I mean, I was well, going to say the answer to the question, anybody who's opposed is anybody who has something to hide. Yes. <laughs> yes who's opposed to Well, it. to give you a perfect example, I mean, we're working to highlight the problem of the over half a million people that have been displaced by the Burmese dictatorship. Uh, Burma, Burma's dictatorship is one of the most repressive regimes in the world, and the people that are documenting the violations of that dictatorship inside Burma literally risk their lives to do so. And when we get that footage, we have to preserve their security and safety. Okay, and let's take that example and let's, let's yeah. trace it forward. So you make that video of the violation of human rights and, and the atrocities that might be committed by a regime that wants to stay in power. Mm -hmm. What do you do with it? Well, in that case, Burma is complicated because some some countries are not brand sensitive, as we might say. Um, you have to assess whether or not a country actually has any interest in maintaining um, a presence in the court of public opinion. In the context of Burma, the question, as in any other context, is who can really leverage um, a persuasive argument for that particular player, and when and where can you utilize that leverage? You so, see, that's where I'm interested. How do you utilize the leverage? I mean. We all know about the trial. I think no, we all. A lot of people who do what I do, or who in journalism know, mm -hmm. you know, and and who work for programs that do investigative journalism know. I mean, that's a. How how do you exercise the leverage? You present it to who who's going to do something about the issue. Right. Well, let me who give you some who? some concrete examples. Okay. Okay. So we work with a group in Mexico, Comisión Mexicana, to highlight the problem of David, who was tortured into confessing to the rape and murder of his cousin Neira. We use this. It's a, it's it's one story which exemplifies a broader problem. Over three hundred women missing from Chihuahua and Ciudad Juarez over the last few years. Dramatic misadministration of justice. The Mexican government perpetually involved in fabricating culprits through the use of torture and interrogation. So we use one single story, which is so potent and so powerful, and we get that screen both here in U.S. Congress to mobilize congressional representatives to call on the Mexican government to make a difference, and with the Attorney's General Office in the state of Chihuahua. And several days after, uh, that screening and that kind of public pressure coming from both the United States and within Mexico takes place. The Attorney General states that there may not be enough evidence to continue to hold him, and we do anticipate a release. I think sometimes it's a name Those and shame. are individual cases of people who are up against a judicial system. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Well, that's one kind of work that we do, mm -hmm. although not, not entirely. I think that what we showed earlier, system failure, is another kind of example, and, and, and Van can talk quite yeah. effectively to the can ways in which... talk about the prisons in California. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that we often talk about when we talk about human rights, we often assume that there's a country far away, someplace that we need to be looking at. But we also have human rights abuses in the United States. Our organization is a national effort to deal with human rights abuses in U.S. prisons, especially youth prisons. California has the biggest population of young people behind bars of all 50 states. And we have eight prisons. One of them, in particular, Chad, is so abusive. It's so horrific. Uh, the kids come out, they're traumatized. Four kids have taken their lives in there in the past 18 months. And we were getting complaint after complaint, screaming about this. Nobody listened. Nobody believed us. We partnered with Witness. We got a video camera. We shot, shot footage. We talked to people. We talked to the parents of these kids who were talking about what it's like to have a kid come home. They were messing up one summer. They come home three years later broken, traumatized, afraid to even go in the mall, afraid to talk to anybody. And we made a film. We took that film to the state legislature, screened it before legislators. And to make a long story short, it created a firestorm of, of controversy. Legislation was introduced. There were 5,000 kids in prison in California when we started, uh, now 3,200, because local prosecutors, local judges, seeing these films realized, I'm sentencing these kids to that? No way. And so we're in the process now of changing it. Having the film, being able to show it made the difference. Was this system failure? System failure. All right, take a look. Here's an example of system failure, some of the scenes. There have been cases of young people on lockdown in the CYA for months and even years at a time. Young people being put on lockdown when they're victims of an assault inside and staying in lockdown for 16, 18 months. Most states, most courts think about separate and solitary confinement as an emergency measure that you end within 72 hours. Uh, it is incomprehensible that we put young people in these places. About a year and a half of lockdown out of three years. That's a lot of days. 
and loneliness. I think it's of all the things I think that might have really damaged him the most was being lonely. Since he's been in protective custody, he's gotten jumped four times, and it's a lockup unit. Everybody's in their own room. The only way he can possibly get injured is because of staff neglect. My son's not allowed to call me because they took that privilege away. So I have to leave on a Sunday, drive, try to maintain myself as I drive two hours home, make worrying if my son went back to his room and didn't get jumped on the way going back to his room. And I'll never know until I either get a letter from him or I have to wait until I come and see him um, the following Sunday. So I have to try to work and just live wondering what happened to him. And it's not right. System failure had the impact of getting legislators to look to take, to, take, to take a look, to take it seriously, and to, and to begin to take action. And if, if any of your, your viewers are interested, booksnotbars.org shows the, this campaign and gives people an opportunity to take action. Because the one thing that we've learned is that... What does Books Not Bars do? Books Not Bars, we organize the parents of kids who are locked up. So that, because what, what, one thing that happens, when a kid gets hurt, they call mom, mom calls us, and we call right, the legislature. Right. right. It, it, but is it any more than sort of staff indifference to, in, is, it, is it staff brutality you're talking about, or is it is staff inability to correct inmate abuse of other inmates? Yes, uh, to, to all of it. it we, we call it system failure because this film shows how step by step by step the entire system is failing these young people. I mean, are you guys involved in sort of the, the, all the issues that have gotten a lot of attention recently in terms of, of women and slavery and all of those kinds of things? I mean, that would seem to be what... In, fa in fact, that's how we got to meet uh, Gillian, because she was uh, uh, originally a witness partner working on uh, uh, former Soviet territories and s sex slave trafficking there. So, um, now, how did the cameras play a role there? I did a three-year undercover investigation into the Russian Mafia's involvement in trafficking women for forced prostitution. So we posed as foreign buyers interested in purchasing women, and we wore uh, hidden cameras and documented those meetings and produced when a the film. the meetings took place? The meetings took place in Moscow, St. Yeah. Petersburg, and Vladivostok, as well as uh, locations throughout Germany and uh, Asia and here in the United States. So the focus on that was to give you an insider's perspective on organized crime and how it's involved in the use and recruitment of women for forced prostitution worldwide. And I think what's, what's so important about this story is, you know, Gillian risked her life and a lot of the people who, who make these risk their Everybody lives. Everybody will sit down with them. Yeah, because, so, yeah exactly. The Russian mafia risk yeah. their exactly. lives. Exactly. Risk their lives challenging the Russian mm -hmm. mafia, documenting it, getting it on, and then taking it to Hillary Clinton, taking it to the United Nations, taking it to people who can make a difference. One of the things that we've learned in, with witnesses, uh, working with witnesses, is not just getting the videotape. It's like you said. It's knowing who to show it to. Yeah, they, that's, they, that's they, one they, so that Hillary Clinton or the United Nations yeah. people who will take it and do something and demand something change. Well, the first time Hillary Clinton talked about trafficking was in Ukraine in 1997, and I had hand-delivered a copy of the report in the film that we produced to her, and she took it, and she, st and she spoke for the first time about trafficking. President Clinton issued an executive or order several months later in March of 1998 allocating $10 million to fight violence against women, and we helped conceptualize the Clinton administration's anti-trafficking response and interagency uh, approach to that whole problem. We supported the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which passed Congress in 2000. We got a multinational grants program out of the Soros Foundation to support local organizations. Direct result of the visual media, because it was undeniable. Has the miniaturization and increased technology uh, and, and the evolution of the technology made this easy and easy to do from a standpoint of being able to, to do it without discovery? Well, absolutely. I mean, this, the camera gets smaller and smaller and it gets less and less expensive. And as that happens, and as cameras become more ubiquitous and they're even taking the shape of cell phones these days, our role in the mix becomes more and more important insofar as we, we help guide people in strategic terms and thinking about how to make a difference. Because everybody's a media maker and a media distributor today. That's part of the worldwide revolution right there. Yeah. You know, everybody their own filmmaker. What are you doing with cell phones? Well, it's just the, the opportunity is absolutely enormous in a sense that we thought, you know, part of the original mission was to get cameras out to the world. But in a way, 
cameras are, are traveling out to the world anyway, di disguised inside phones. And, and in, say, Orwell's vision of 1984, one of the means through which those in power controlled those who weren't was through observation. And in a way, it's trying to flip that on its head, that if we get cameras out everywhere, perhaps through observation, uh, the small guy, the little guy, can keep an eye on those in, uh, in We're power. watching Big Brother, is that the idea? Exactly. And so, well, I really think, you know, the, the whole of the Internet revolution is about putting power down the bottom rather than just up the top. And uh, so we're now at a real point of transition. And, you know, the dream is that we could have a site, a website that anyone that is desperate and suffering that has images can get them uploaded, that uh, would be effectively a new human right, that if you suffer abuse, you get your story recorded, seen, and heard. Then the campaign, you hope, will result from that. But, but that's the starting point. All right. Uh, Dual Injustice, which is one of the films uh, which a mother discussed the kidnap and murder of her daughter and the wrongful arrest of her nephew for crime, debuts on the Sundance Channel on Human Rights Day, December 10th. Um, congratulations, Peter, to your work. Congratulations. To you. What's your book there? Is that? Oh, this is Video for Change, a guide for advocacy and activism. It's coming out in six languages, available at our website at witness.org and on Amazon. It's basically a how-to guide for using video to create change. Video is evidence, storytelling and advocacy, grassroots distribution strategies, um, sort of soup to nuts, case study driven based on work with 200 organizations worldwide in 60 countries. A, a dream for witness.org has always been that it should be a service to, to all those in the human rights movement rather than a competitor uh, as fundamental. It has always been my impression that outside of perhaps um, a few people in the entertainment world, you know more about technology than anybody else. Is that uh, true? Well, my dad was an inventor, so uh, <laughs> and has quite a few patents that I just pulled out of uh, the patent office. So I have a natural interest. I'm in not technology. I'm not very good with it, but I'm very fascinated. <laughs> but but, but, but what, what I have to say about, about Peter Gabriel is, you know, he's the person who has, the I think, the strongest commitment of anybody I've met to using these tools for good and getting them down to the little guys, the people in Botswana, the people who nobody is hearing from, making sure that those tools get in their hand. Now, this is, you know, 10 years ago, before it was fashionable, everybody's talking about technology. Peter was moving to make sure the technology that was then cutting edge was given to the people at the bottom. And uh, my hope and my, hope, my faith is that Witness, as a partner organization, not just my organization, but organizations really around the world and individuals around the world, will accelerate this cry for justice that's really just waiting to be heard around the world. And let us empower the International Criminal Court, because I think probably the most important thing in my lifetime in many ways is the creation of this International Criminal Court. But The United States uh, doesn't support the, it. The United States doesn't support it, and it's absolutely shameful. You know, if, if United States that uh, represented a dream of freedom and justice for so many people can't get behind this, you know, what is it, what is it there for? Well, they were that Americans would be hauled away to, to of some course kind of there is fear. adjudication yeah, but, that didn't deserve to be there. But surely if you stand up, if you're willing to stand up for anything, you should be uh, willing to, to stand up and be counted for your principles. And, and the ICC would only adjudicate in an instance where a country was unwilling or unable to prosecute uh, the relevant crimes. Now, we may face that situation in the context of the United States. I don't think they've moved as proactively as they might have in the context of Abu Ghraib and a, a, a variety of incidents that we've all that have that have come to light. But the bottom line is that, you know, it should be in the very uh, few instances in which the ICC actually has to intervene. Grave abuses of uh, humanity like what we're seeing in Uganda and, and the Congo today. How do you make distinctions between people who may be abusing an Abu Ghraib situation and someone who sends a, someone who recruits and sends a suicide bomber into combat as violators of of human rights. Yeah, well, I think the biggest difference in the human rights context is that human rights is all about holding governments accountable for violations of human rights. And what you're talking about in the context of an individual suicide bomber is individual action, which in fact isn't covered by human rights treaties and principles. Same thing when you look at, for example, multinational investment and involvement in 
uh, the uh, conflict diamond issue, for example. I mean, the business, businesses, as it stands right now, aren't held accountable under a human rights regime. So, in fact, the administration of justice looks at it very differently. You have the human rights context, and then you have the national legislation, which would be pertinent to a suicide bombing. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you. Pleasure to have you. Thank you very much.